So, officially, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you. Oh, eh, the weather is not very nice today, but I'm very glad that we are all together. Uh, the weather might not be nice, but the room in the Royal Palace in Warsaw is uh, really beautiful. The classical uh, interior. Uh, this is not a traditionally classicist interior, but uh, maybe rather post-liberal or in the modern art. I think this uh, interior is really a beautiful. Welcome once again on the Second Congress of Classical Education. Uh, this is becoming a small tradition, and I hope uh, we will uh, continue on organizing those uh, educational congresses because um, I think there is such need, which is proven by your presence here. I would like to welcome the Minister of uh, Education, Professor Czarnek. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, the situation is rather tense. Therefore, he had to stay in the uh, chancellery of the prime minister on the urgent meeting of the government uh, due to what happened yesterday on the eastern border. Therefore, uh, uh, he will not be here uh, now, but uh, perhaps, uh, and I hope they will uh, join us later. But on behalf of uh, the minister, I would like to welcome you all. I would like to welcome the plenipotentiary of the Minister of Education, uh, Mr. Gurecki. I would like to welcome plenipotentiary of the Ministry of uh, Family, Tomasz Pituka. I would like to welcome plenipotentiary of the Minister of Education and Science, uh, Dr. Jakub Koper. I would like to welcome all the superintendents uh, of education who joined us uh, from all around the country the directors of centers uh, of uh, education for teachers. There's still a lot of uh, free seats in the front. I would like to welcome all the teachers, lecturers, whether in uh, high schools or universities, um, all the distinguished guests. Thank you very much for being with us today. I am very glad that I am here for the second time already. Um, I hope this will also become tradition. We are all here to um, to wonder, to draw conclusions uh, from what we discussed last year. We had uh, very fruitful discussions on classical education, and uh, maybe it's not so present in mass media or in schools or universities as other types of education. But your presence here shows us that there is a need to discuss it. Um, and how uh, to uh, make this type of education more significant, uh, because this is a great uh, way of shaping uh, people's uh, characters, of uh, educating uh, righteous and beautiful people. And uh, this is what uh, we will be discussing uh, today also. The uh, aim of this Congress is uh, to uh, make uh, the uh, classical education more uh, common, more known to people. Um, we are getting back to this relation between the student and the um, master. It does not exist so much anymore right now. I am myself, uh, so to say, middle-aged, and I have uh, quite a lot of uh, experience in professional life. But uh, when I was um, studying uh, journalism, and when I was uh, Entering my professional life, I was learning from uh, my older colleagues. Uh, I was being mentored. Uh, unfortunately, those relations do not exist that much uh, today. If uh, and if they do, they are rather rare, and we need to do something with it so that the youth uh, feels also such need, because we. Um, might feel it, but we need to promote it among the uh, young people. The agenda is quite rich. There will be a lot of speeches, but there will also be a discussion at the end, so you will be able to ask questions. We also have one guest from abroad. You uh, probably know because you received the agenda up front. Then I will, um, just before the coffee break, uh, I will ask you uh, 
all of you who do not uh, speak English that well, uh, I, will, I will ask you to take a headset so that you can understand the speech. Uh, before um, I uh, ask uh, a more competent person to present an introduction, let's uh, listen to what Minister Czarnek wanted to uh, tell us. Uh, the second Congress of Classical Education organized by the Ministry of Education and Science is a perfect occasion to discuss a classical education and the meaning of what is timeless in the process of education. Uh, speakers from Poland and abroad will uh, address important topics, the meaning of uh, classical education, classical paideia, as cultivation of a human music, as a liberal art, uh, the role of Latin and Greek in Polish education, and also experiences uh, from other practice in education. At the end of the Congress, there will be a discussion about the uh, challenges of classical education. Um, the uh, wise come back to what has been uh, tried in terms of education. It seems to be a good alternative for the state of uh, events. Uh, uh, promoting intellect and willingfulness of uh, humans who uh, creates uh, um, uh, free people who are aware of uh, the uh, surrounding reality. We also uh, need to be humble and patient um, and brave, and this is what I wish you during this conference. And uh, I uh, join those uh, wishes. Thank you very much, Minister. I hope uh, that the Minister will join us uh, during our meeting later. So and now uh, the um, conference will be opened by the Director of the Department of General Education of Curriculum, uh, Mr. Guretsky. Thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction and the understanding for the topic at hand. Uh, a year ago, at the opening of the first Congress of Classical Education, I said with some hope that under favorable circumstances, uh, we could, uh, vital sap could find its way to even seemingly dead branches. And in, today, we're speaking about uh, the directions of the um, state uh, uh, education uh, curricula established by the Education and Science Minister. Last year, as well as in the current year, uh, among other things, we, uh, we have inscription of uh, working on canons of classical education and uh, drawing on the heritage of European civilization. Uh, let's hope that these are not just empty declarations uh, included in the official documents, which for formal formality's sake we need to fulfill. Let me re remind you of the last year's Congress at which um, both the speakers of Poland and abroad spoke about the education for will and mind, uh, agility, uh, and uh, place of classics in the European curriculum. And on the, on the example of the Artes Liberales um, of American system, they spoke about the importance of the Latin and philosophy as importance uh, in the course of uh, the year 2021-2022, we've held a, a national uh, oratory Olympiad. This year, we also have a similar um, Olympiad organized, with the main idea being to introduce young people into the circle of uh, intellectual culture, uh, high culture, uh, through learning um, about the world that surrounds us and the uh, after weeks of hard expert work the minister of Ed ministry of education and science uh, submitted for public consultation uh, a draft core curriculum for latin subject this stipulates that starting from next year, in other words, 2023-24, students of Form 7 of the elementary school and the first 
platform of the high schools as well as technical schools will be able to choose Latin as their second language, foreign language. In a matter of uh, 10 plus days, we will have training meetings to work with students with uh, um, interest in, in Latin. Um, and this will be provided for teachers of that subject. Another important uh, project is that in November of uh, this year, we have completed uh, another import preparation of in another important uh, subject uh, as commissioned by the Ministry of Education. And this is the Brevarium of the Cultural Canon. This is a, uh, uh, and provides encounters with poetic works uh, representing European educational canon. This will reach all of the secondary high school schools and train, teacher training centers. Uh, this uh, uh, brevarium will hopefully become a model tool to help confront students with the timeless and unchanging uh, as uh, for transmission of culture. And at the uh, Sulayuvek uh, teacher training centers, we will hold a seminar uh, entitled Canon of Authors and its Educational um, Potential. This will be ad addressed to teachers, uh, methodology advisors, and we, they will propose uh, uh, pro uh, the content coming from that specific uh, collection to uh, the uh, core curriculum. And uh, we do hope uh, for full renaissance of uh, classical education is this Congress that we participate in. During the second Congress, the speakers will touch on important topics, such as importance of classic education for modern man, classical paideia as the integral mm, cultivation of man, music as the liberated or liberal art, and will uh, also propose conclusions from Polish experience of implementing this classical education model. The culmination of the Congress will be the discussion around the subject of classical education in the face of contemporary challenges. Now, uh, these uh, life, uh, life bringing juices uh, in a tree are the the heritage of the Greek paideia and Roman humanitas, completed by Christianity, which uh, ultimately uh, created this or reworked this as uh, its own educational program. Unfortunately, from the dawn of modernity, this process slowed down and uh, we observed departure. Uh, finally, this formula uh, was limited uh, to, uh, this was uh, dwindled down to study of classical languages. And uh, no, uh, no one questions uh, the uh, individual subjects, but there isn't a greater, uh, uh, greater curse than the encyclopedic approach. Mm, now, the uh, ideology comes as as a uh, phantom mm, and uh, we uh, education focuses on uh, on just a referral of ac ac mm, academic knowledge and scientific knowledge so we are looking for more than uh, encyclopedic rule for education these this search is uh, uh, paint of the, the modern which is better. So as a rule, uh, we cannot state the obvious question, what if we had classical education as the basis? Today, that form of education is being referred to as liberal education. Let us hope that this Congress will be a great opportunity to exchange ideas between representatives of various uh, mm, uh, departments dealing with uh, classical education, from reflection on human being to 
uh, practice of education. Uh, the fruit will be a greater interest combined with a deeper desire to study among all of those in, engaged in uh, education. In the longer term, uh, we hope for uh, this model of classical education adjusted to today's realities could be implemented in practice. What is needed for that, however, is to reject the uh, understanding of pedagogy, which assumes that the task, its task is to provide effective methodologies and means to fulfill ad hoc goals arising from what is conventional and transient now in favor of education based on eternal and unchanging. The achievement of present uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, a reduction of everything to imminent uh, uh, realities, whereas here we are looking for true principles and causes against schemes and illusions. Now, education is to establish a natural order of the soul, as Plato uh, told us. And this is, uh, engages in uh, shaping of character based on things that are eternal. And it, we do not uh, count for uh, spectacular results, but uh, keeping in mind that a great tasks can be achieved through concrete limited works and uh, long-term thinking should be uh, always accompanying this. Uh, the uh, one book is des describes this task as such. Hold on to two uh, couple of uh, well-tested uh, uh, books and uh, oratory. Uh, keep keep away from. Uh, 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 current discussion of current uh, uh, events only, which have all, all, almost completely pressed out uh, classical literature. This is not an easy road, yet uh, important one. I'd like to express my appreciation to Minister Przemysław Czarnek, uh, without whose commitment and uh, will this event could not have taken place also engagement of the political cab cabinet um, of ministers, uh, representative Mr. Radosław Brzuska, and hopefully he will also take part in the discussion panel. Thank you to the edu Educational Research Institute, uh, the Center for Educational Development, and the Zamoyski Academy, and all those involved. Uh, impossible to mention them all here. Uh, but each t according to their merits and efforts put in. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. You've said that this is not an easy way forward. Very true. Thank you for mentioning this broken chain of education. We have been speaking about uh, broken delivery uh, supply chains, mm, such as uh, uh, production of uh, cars or electronic uh, um, equipment, whereas breaking of a chain of heritage is not something we readily think about. There won't be education, classical education, without poetry, particularly the wonderful poetry, including Polish poetry. We, we uh, a, a Polish uh, actor is now uh, Mariusz Kowalski will now will present to us fragments of Prometidion of uh, Cyprian Kavid Norwid. Do czytelnika. Forma greckiego dialogu zdała mi się być najkorzystniejszą do zaszczepienia głównych pojęć o powadze sztuki. W dialogu pierwszym idzie o formę, to jest piękno, w drugim o treść, to jest o dobro i o światłość obu, 
prawdę. Autor, nie mając na celu rozumu, który zaczyna od negacji i kończy na negacji, to jest kroku nie robi, ale mając na celu mądrość, która zaczyna od bojaźni Bożej, bo początkiem mądrości bojaźń Boża, a kończy na wolności w Bogu, musi sobie krzyżem, to jest bolesnym bojowaniem, drogę pierwej otwierać. I dlatego czytelnik wiele niemiłych rzeczy tam napotka, których smutno było dożyć w sobie, smutniej dowiedzieć się, a jeszcze smutniej wywlekać na forum i pasować się z nimi. Gorzką taką pracę, dlaczego żeś przedsięwziął? Taka rozmowa była o Chopinie, który naczelnym u nas jest artystą. Co do mnie polski, ja w nim zamach cenię, nie melancholię romantyczną glistą. I chociaż małe mam wyobrażenie o sztuce, przecie wiem, co jest muzyka i może lepiej wiem od grającego. Kiedy mi serce bierze i odmyka, jak ktoś do domu wchodzący własnego. Jest to zapewne wiele, rzekł Bogumił, lecz ja bym raczej myśl artysty badał i czy dosłownie naród on spowiadał. Czy się nie wstydził prawdy i nie stłumił, mogąc łatwiejszy poklask zyskać sobie? mogąc być prędzej i szerzej uznanym. Czy mówię prawdę, na swym stawiał grobie, czy się jej grobem podpierał ciosanym? Cóż te morały do rzeczy należą? Konstanty na to ozwał się z młodzieżą. Albo cóż prawda, tam gdzie jest udanie, tam gdzie jest wszystko przez naśladowanie. Albo muzyka, co by mi znaczyła? Żebym ją musiał jak hierogliw badać, lub wedle onych pomięć Bogu miła, żebym się musiał w Mazurku spowiadać. Co pięknym to się każdemu podoba i konfesjonał na to niepotrzebny. Ho, hop, koniku mój, rwij się od żłoba. Ho, hop, cóż na to, Bogu mił wielebny. Tu się rozśmiało wielu, co już znaczy, że najzupełniej prawda okazaną i że mówiący pięknie się tłumaczy. I już o sztuce tu nie rozmawiano, tylko grający, stojąc przy pulpicie o kompozycji, mówili w warunkach. O tym wcielaniu życia w sztuki, życie, gdzie kałkuł w duchu i duch sam w rachunkach. Więc znów rozmowa, własną prawdę wagą, w nieśmiertelniejszej powracała zbroi. Bo są nieznane siły, które nagą myśl, gdy już o nią dumny człowiek nie stoi. Na niespodzianym stawiają świeczniku. Bo jest, powiadam, w słowa określniku architektura taka jak te gmachy, gdzie któryś z mędrców starożytnych mniema, że duch się jego mieści, to na dachy, wstępując płaskie, to pomiędzy dwiema kolumny w cieniach stając, to w piwnicy. Więc i z rozmowy duchem tak się stało. Co piękne nie jest, to mówił Maurycy, co się podoba dziś lub podobało, lecz co się winno podobać, jak nie mniej i to, co dobre jest, nie z czym przyjemniej, lecz co ulepsza. Co do mnie, jeżeli tu o harmonii mówim, hrabia rzeknie, ta jest z porządku. Gdzie porządnie, pięknie, gdzie bez rząd chaos z szatanem anieli. Więc dyscyplina u mnie, a uczciwa, jest tą harmonią łączącą ogniwa. O Grecjo, ciebie, że kochano, widzę dziś jeszcze w każdej marmuru kruszynie, 
w naśladownictwie, którego się wstydzę za wiek mój, w kolumn karbowanych trzcinie, opłakiwanej od wierzchu akantem, w łamanych wierszach naukania zapału i w sokratejskiej sowie z ucz brylantem i w całej filos twojej aż do szału. O Rzymie, ciebie, że kiedyś kochano, w kodeksie jeszcze widzę barbarzyńskim, którego krzyżem dotąd nie złamano. W akademickim języku latyńskim, w pofałszowanych Cezarach i w słowie Roma to odwróć, a morci odpowie. O Polsko wiem ja, że artystów czołem są męczennicy, tych sztuka popiołem. Ale czyż wszyscy, wszyscy wiedzą to w ojczyźnie? I czy posiałaś sztuką krwawe żyźnie? O gdybym jedną kaplicę zobaczył, choćby jak pokój ten wielkości taki, gdzie by się polski duch raz wytłumaczył, usymbolicznił rozkwitłymi znaki, gdzie by kamieniarz, cieśla, mularz, snycerz, poeta, wreszcie męczennik i rycerz odpoczął w pracy, czynie i w modlitwie. Gdzieby czerwony marmur, cios, żelazo, mieć, brąz i modrze w Polski się zjednały pod postaciami co niejedną skazą, poryte leżą w nas, jak w sercu skały. To w tym o pięknym przypowieść ma leży i tak ja widzę przyszłą w Polsce sztukę, jako chorągiew na prac ludzkich wierzy. Nie jak zabawkę, ani jak naukę, lecz jak najwyższe z rzemiosł apostoła i jak najniższą modlitwę anioła. Pomiędzy tymi praca się stopniuje, aż niepotrzebne prace zginąć muszą. Ze zbudowania w duchu się buduje. Smak się oczyszcza i żądze się głuszą. Przyroda nie ma, jest uszanowaną. I rozebrzmiewa czyn długą hosanną. Jeśli mistycyzm jest to urojenie lub urojenie tylko mistycyzmem, to nie wiem za co słowo to sumienie miałby dotykać kto z was ostracyzmem. I owszem, to jest urzeczywistnienie najdoskonalsze i może jedyne. I owszem, brylant to jest, który wagą przecieka, prując powierzchowną glinę. I owszem, prawda to z swą piersią nagą. Widzicie, prawda jest, tylko się pali pod popiołami białymi, co leżą jako westalek chór z śnieżną odzieżą. Owóż opinii jeszcze onej cieniem jest i milczenie to wasze przed chwilą, bo ona rzekłem też, że jest promieniem ostatnim proroctw. Sny jej się nie mylą. Ona jak chmury dotknie, to wystrzela. Ona jak słowo rzeknie, to się wciela. Ona jak czoło pomarze, to wstawa i promienieje i promień rozdawa, bo ona głosem ludu, głosem Boga. Tu muszę szerzej mówić, tu jeżeli bym przerwał krzywa, by was mogła droga tam powieść, kiedy źli chodzą anieli. Tu już nie pytam was o pozwoleństwo, sam mówię, skądże ów głos ma pierwszeństwo, czemu na puszczy on ma być wołaniem, a stąd proroctwem, czemu? W Izraelu skąd są proroki? Z tym się zapytaniem przechadzam. Otóż widzę ich tam wielu, jako z pospólstwem z książęty, z kapłany najuporczywiej walczą te łachmany. Któż oni? Prawo jakie ich popiera? To, że dla prawdy każdy z nich umiera. Co dzień, co chwila, co słowo, co groza, co oklask. Prawa przed nimi litera drży jak pod wiatrów skrzydłem żółta łoza i mają tylko dwa warunki z góry. 
Pierwszy, że jeden ojców Bóg, a wtóry, żeby walczyli prawdą i dla prawdy. O Polsko, Twoim proroctwo wyznaniem, bo jednaś dzisiaj na puszczy wołaniem. Tak wierzę, tak jest, ile człowiek może, że jest powiedzieć, tak jest, wielki Boże. Tu przemilkł, potem rzekł, prawdy powietrze, póki jest czyste. Wszystko się rozwija. Weselsze kwiaty, liście w sobie letrze, jaśniejszy lilic dzban, smuklejsza szyja, wolniejszy człeka ruch i myśli człeka. To zbrudź, to zamądź. Liść, kwiat, człowiek czeka. A chce, chcecież wiedzieć tego, który mąci? Oto patrzajcie, tam stoi ten krwawiec i mówi, jam jest, który Pana strąci z wysoka, jako zepsuty latawiec. Jam jest, któremu msze się także mruczą w każdym pochlebstwie sobie, w każdym swarze, w teatrze pychy własnej, w pychy farze. Ileż to razy za piękne on stawił, potworne. Peruk piętrowaniem bawił, bo mu dorogów były podobniejsze lub natętością szat, bo tym próżniejsze. Albo wspinaniem się na korki twarde, jak kopyt róg lub musem na postawy harde i rozrzucenia bohaterskie włosa, zmrużenia powiek, w górę podrzucenia nosa, schylenia powiek na kształt dojrzałego kłosa. To on, mąciciel, który mszy tych i kantyków z daleka słucha puty, póki tuman czyniąc, aż mają uszy, a nie słyszą krzyków, aż Boga przedać idą, gdzie za pieniądz i przepijają szaty Jezusowe. Cała tajemnica postępu ludzkości le leży na tym, aby coraz więcej stanowczo przez wcielanie dobra i rozjaśnianie prawd broń największa, jedyna, ostateczna to jest męczeństwo uniepotrzebniało się na ziemi. Trzeba bardzo czystego powietrza prawdy, ażeby skutek ten nastąpił. I trzeba urobienia wytwornego powściągliwości, aby miejsce dla głoszącego prawdę się znalazło. Dariusz Kowalski, thank you very much for this uh, spiritual uh, celebration. If I understood correctly, we have a very young uh, student here in the room. Congratulations and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, forgot to inform you that the uh, second the patronage is taken by the Ministry of uh, Education, but also Institute of Educational Research, the Center for Development of Education and uh, Zamoyska Academy. Uh, holding patronage over this Congress. And let's start the scientific uh, plenary session. Professor Włodzimierz Dłubacz will be the first speaker. He's been working for many years on Catholic uh, University in Lublin. He specializes in classical philosophy. He's especially interested in the philosophy of God, metaphysics, the philosophy of society and uh, politics, philosophy of religion. He is an author of uh, over 200 uh, uh, books. He's a lecturer and a member of many scientific societies, as we see. Uh, he has a, a large experience. So Professor Dubac will make a speech entitled Classical Education Today, its essence, structure and uh, goal. Mm -hmm. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the trust and congratulations for organizing this type of Congress. I also think it's very needed. I'm not working the theory of classical education. I'm a practitioner of certain academic education. And also my family uh, works in education, so I have an overview of what has uh, been going on in uh, different schools for the last uh, years. And this, these will be also my um, reflections and comments that I will present you. Uh, I have a small problem that I have to share with you. My uh, glasses. Uh, uh, stayed somewhere else, um, and uh, someone was uh, nice, uh, very nice to lend me their glasses. So I do not see very well. So if there are any problems, it means it's because I do not see very well. Uh, the title of my speech is Classical Education Today, but I will be talking about it at the end of my speech. First, I would like to um, say what it is actually, because uh, there are various definitions. There is also a subtitle, the essence, uh, the genesis, uh, structure and method, and the purpose. Let me start from the first point. I will try to control my time. I have only half an hour, so I will not be able to say everything that I wrote. So what is this classical education, how can we put it simply? It's a kind of a program and a process of a teaching and upbringing of a student, a human being, whose purpose is to optimize the human nature, whose uh, purpose is the full development of a human. According to many, classical education is, uh, on the one hand, as was already mentioned today, an alternative for modern to modern education, which has rather utilitarian character, which is uh, um, specified by the demands of uh, job market. On the other side, it's also education and bringing of a human based on realistic anthropology. And its purpose is uh, to develop a person as a human being, their uh, reason, their will, and also feelings to some extent. It's about shaping uh, such uh, skills that will allow a person to recognize uh, the truth and the good and uh, master, control the emotions. Already in antiquity, the ways of improving the intellect and a will, a human will, were discovered. So the question arises, is there a need and how should we use the long tradition of a classical education? The real education, as we say, meaning full education, of a human being has a wisdom character. Its purpose, uh, um, it should uh, serve a human so that he can, they can uh, direct their lives uh, responsibly so that they achieve the purpose of their lives so that uh, a person fulfills themselves as a human. So wisdom is knowledge. Uh, which is the most important for a human being is the knowledge about uh, the whole reality mm, in the light of its um, first causes. Uh, at the moment, wisdom is uh, understood differently. Education has rather encyclopedic character. Is that not enter deep into the reality? It does not have the vertical character, but rather a horizontal one. This knowledge is to be translated into technical um, usage and should be related in the possibility of uh, reshaping, uh, modifying the world. It's supposed to. Um, 
serve to fulfill the material needs of a person. We rather pose questions about uh, certain education being useful. Young people ask, what is this school or education going to give them? And what will be their benefits from this knowledge? But what they mean are rather material benefits. Uh, for example, in the form of a high salary or organizing themselves in the modern world. Uh, obviously, this is understandable, but a human being cannot be reduced to their profession. They will not uh, uh, be um, satisfied uh, in the civilization. A person should live up to their um, their size as a human and their possibilities, they should discover who they are, where they come from, and where they are going. So a person should discover the truth about himself. We are, to some extent, the children of our times. We draw a lot of attention to uh, the crisis in culture, and we try to find a remedy to this crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a crisis of culture, but of a human. This crisis uh, is about the being lost in the world that is uh, created by the human because they do not even know the purpose of their activity anymore. Therefore, we are looking for the remedy for this human crisis. And according to others, this is education understood uh, in classical terms. Because an educated person is a person who has real knowledge about the whole reality, not only the material reality, but also a person who understands the reality and appreciates the wisdom knowledge because this knowledge shows them the way and the purpose of life. The classical education is to deliver this type of knowledge. It's a kind of entering into this mysterious world of nature and culture of the human heritage. Also, the cognitive uh, heritage, all uh, the achievements. The classical education is about a full development as a human, of a human as a person, their intellect, but also their will and their feelings. Can we uh, reactivate classical education uh, bringing today? It is not. Uh, um, completely absent from modern school, even though we live uh, in the culture which is submitted to the uh, mass, uh, to the influence of mass culture, um, which is full of entertainment, we still value the truth, even though we limit it often to the scientific knowledge about the nature, um, especially focusing on this knowledge being useful. We might say that uh, the so-called um, scientific enlightenment is to replace uh, the religion, is to provide the vision uh, of the world, uh, of the world of uh, nature, uh, where a person is only a part. Therefore, we are focusing on the practical side of the education. We do not appreciate the meaning of uh, finding out about the truth for itself. We do not appreciate developing the potential of a student. Today, um, we um, promote a human being. Uh, we believe in progress, where the human being is the main purpose of the reality. So from the point of view of wisdom, we might say that a human lost their purpose and lost their way. Classical education, according to um, to its supporters, it's a kind of a, a proper universal education or the truthful education, so one that corresponds to a human as a human. So what is the genesis uh, of the education? 
If we talk about it, we will put light into its essence. Education comes from Latin, but its essence is in the Greek culture from Athens. It means the whole of activities and attempts in order to um, form a child uh, morally and physically. The beginnings of this idea can be found in the works of Homer, as we know, based on this uh, a special a, a certain pattern of ideal of a, a wise, uh, mature person was created, of a righteous, virtu virtuous uh, person who is characterized by physical and mental beauty. This uh, ideal can be achieved in human life through um, a proper education. Uh, the fourth up idea, which will be discussed by other speakers, the theory of education and upbringing was uh, actually created uh, by um, sophists which um, who created uh, a special education program uh, covering rhetorics and dialectics. Uh, they also divided uh, the education system into a primary and secondary. This concept was uh, possible and necessary at the same time because sophists um, um, kind of distinguished a human being from all other entities in the nature. So uh, they understood that a human being cannot be reduced to the world of nature. It's something else and a different entity. So they accentuated the specific place of a human in the world. As we know, also Socrates um, contributed to the development of education because uh, he was talking a lot about the morality, the meaning of morality in life, and his genius student, Plato, also said that a human being, despite of in born inherited uh, skills, needs also education for full development. This will liberate them from the prison of their senses and will direct them towards the real knowledge and the good written in capital letter. Oh, the path to achieve this wisdom, according to Plato, is philosophy. So the love of of wisdom, striving to achieve the wisdom. Um, then his student Aristotle draw the attention to the fact that education should correspond to the human nature. So who the human being is, and this human nature um, is. Uh, the body and the soul, according to Aristotle, the human nature, and this was also um, discovered by the Greeks, is potentialized. It's uh, a developing over time. A person is not fully skilled from the beginning, so this knowledge needs to be updated. And this is uh, the main task of education. The human nature of its own will not uh, develop. A child left on the street is not going to develop. It's going to die. Therefore, a human being will not fulfill himself without education. Romans, on the other hand, took also this concept, a Greek concept to a large extent, but they separated uh, education and uh, upbringing. The upbringing was left to the family, but this is this was all already an idea of Aristotle, and the education was given to the teachers, so the, the institution of school. They also separated sciences with school with education, um, average education, including arithmetics, geometry, astronomy, and music, which were called artes liberales, so liberal sciences, because uh, they were not uh, made to bring uh, money in the future. Um, I'm sorry I missed uh, uh, one um, except of my text because of my glasses. So they separated the, scien the sciences, uh, grammar, rhetorics, uh, and all from the uh, science for elites, facultative, such as I mentioned uh, before. Now this microphone is covering a bit uh, the reality for me, uh, meaning uh, my text, uh, but I hope I will uh, manage. So, 
sciences for elites like uh, geometry, uh, music, uh, arithmetics, uh, which were called the liberal sciences because they were not made to bring income in the future. Uh, meeting Christianity with the Greek concept of education um, made uh, um, the education more full by adding the another dimension because the Christians noticed that this pattern of education cannot uh, provide full integral uh, education because it does not contain the full truth about a human being or it does not have enough uh, um, tools to optimize the deve human development. So due to, due to Christianity, education receives a new dimension, new tools, and new tasks. It's uh, open for the supernatural elements, for the God and eternal life, and that's how the classical concept a full classical concept of education was born, and we are kind of missing it today. So it's the antique people who discovered the human nature potential, which requires cultivation, and I drew the attention to the proper um, content and ways of its uh, development and fulfillment. There is also certain human concept behind the concept of uh, education. Today, we forget about the existence of human nature. We try to make the existence of human nature less important. And also, uh, the program of human nature of uh, being a, per a fulfilled person because uh, the concept of nature has uh, two meanings. One of them is that it's uh, the whole world, uh, the nature as a whole world, not um, not philosophical. And then the other understanding is the nature of uh, objects. So here, a person, a human being, has its nature, their nature. So they're equipped in certain potentiality and determined in a way for development. But the direction of this development depends on this human, on the human being, on the, their wisdom, their will. So we have to differentiate it here because we do not uh, deny the existence of nature, but we understand it rather as uh, the whole world. And we do not, we forget this human nature, which was distinguished already by uh, Greeks in antiquity. So the creation of the concept of nature of a human being uh, was actually the basis of the creation of uh, a science. Uh, so this is the source of activity. A dog is a dog because it's a dog of a nature. The same with a human being. So it's very important that sometimes when we argue about this uh, concept of nature, we need to understand uh, what we mean by saying nature. Um, this was something additional outside of uh, my uh, text. Reducing a human being. Um, currently to uh, their uh, consciousness. There is also this educational conviction that we need to give more and more specialist expert knowledge uh, in education. This is about uh, memory, about programming uh, the nature, so to say, as a computer. And then it's going to work. However, a human being cannot it's not an encyclopedia. Thank you very much for your help. So let me repeat. A human is not uh, an encyclopedia. Encyclopedia type information are quite. It's quite specific, uh, not related. They do not provide uh, a coherent picture of the world. These are not holistic knowledge that is needed by a human in order to understand the world. 
So accentuating uh, shaping intellect uh, and uh, exercising uh, the memory is not a full adequate tool for its development. So classical education is uh, a way for for adequate uh, adequate uh, um, growing up to the um, achieve the full scope of development. Uh, point number two, the structure and method of classical education. In general, the method of classical education is uh, teaching and upbringing, referring to the achievements of classical thought, Greek, Roman, and Christian. But it's all in the classical concept, European concept of education, the Christian concept uh, of the European uh, culture. And the guide in this way is to some extent philosophy and theology, which we are missing today. This education uh, keeps maintain certain stages of education, certain order, starting from a general education and moving towards expert professional education. So this is all maintained. The priority is a human as a person and the net, and then a human as an expert having a, a specific profession. It's about teaching a human how to read, how to write, how to think logically, and how to express their thoughts. But also appropriate behavior or sensitivity. It is also very important and kind of neglected currently. So classical education is humanistic uh, education because it's about the good of uh, all the people. Uh, referring to the great achievements uh, of uh, culture, I still think that it's not enough to only shape the intellect. We need to create the will and the feelings because it's the well-shaped mind. It's not enough to be a good human being who uh, directs uh, their life in a proper way. So. What is important is uh, to refer to this great European educational tradition, to its achievements. Uh, and tradition is the analysis of uh, great works uh, in literature, law, politics, theology, philosophy. So getting back to the sources, to the real sources, uh, and uh, not to summaries, uh, as uh, it is very often now. It's uh, supposed to give a full education, the basis to understand the human world and to understand God. So we need to shape intellect. But the mind itself uh, will not suffice a person to lead a decent life. We need to also form the will so that a person will want to um, share up, uh, their character. So it's about educating a person whose uh, good activities uh, are controlled by their reason, by their mind. So the life uh, should be full of reason. As Socrates uh, wrote, wrote, it's not uh, worth uh, uh, living a mediocre life. It's also about uh, reading and discussing great uh, uh, works. A teacher should be a guide and should sh lead and show the way of uh, of achieving the truth. Uh, the student uh, needs to do it on their own, but uh, they should be led by the teacher to uh, reach the goal. So the teacher should show uh, the path, uh, the right path to the students. That's how it should be in school. The education should also teach uh, the culture of uh, being rational. And uh, I also think that philosophy should be present there because we will not uh, understand anything without philosophy. The four, we try to develop the curiosity of the student uh, to show the value of truth, uh, the love of the reality. I would like to um, underline this because it's very important. Um, because sometimes uh, 
We need to show it, show the reality, the world to the students. It's the role of uh, the parents as well. We need to learn the contact with uh, the nature because the nature is rational. It's not logic. Logic is uh, secondary. Logic will not teach us how to think. It's not true. Teaching philosophy should be related uh, with life. It should be mainly a teaching philosophical thinking, not the history of philosophy. This is also secondary. History of philosophy is often treated as the cemetery of human thought. Uh, students uh, learn it because they have to pass the exam. It's rather about educating people who are able to think in a creative way, who understand the sense of uh, discovering the truth. And truth is the reality that we discover. They understand the value of learning. We should also underline uh, the authority of the teacher and rational thinking. All the reforms of education should be started not uh, with programs, but with uh, educating the teachers, because they are the most important here. And the teachers should be uh, educated by the best universities. Uh, it's also about the permanent education. Uh, before the war, uh, each teacher was obliged to stay in contact with the university permanently. What is also important is to show on the um, educational level that the reason should lead the human being also um, the master is uh, presenting the knowledge as a kind uh, of an ideal, a model shaping the will and feelings, uh, sensitivity of a student uh, as well. Third point, the purpose of classical education. The purpose of classical education is uh, creating um, the will and the reason and the skills uh, and uh, the ability to control the feelings and also directing those feelings to what is good for a human being, being uh, creating those acts of will. This is not a utilitarian uh, goal, as often accentuated in education. Uh, it's about general and basic education that should be um, the basis for further education. The students should know how to learn, read, think logically, should uh, have the basic knowledge. But the reality and basic uh, abilities, which should be the fundament of, for further education. These are also tools uh, in which the student should be equipped. Uh, it's about uh, common education. What's also important is to develop the memory. And uh, classical education, as I said, uh, is kind of an introduction at this basic level. It's about acquiring the skills to enter the world of human culture, its heritage, so that they can use it, so that they can become a richer and develop uh, and uh, to bring it further to uh, next generations. So as I already said, in classical education, this uh, basic uh, way of uh, thinking uh, was um, in the uh, philosophy. So. Our students were taught how to analyze texts, how to perform synthesis of text, uh, about the art of persuasion. And today, the classical uh, uh, education cannot be only about knowing classical languages, Greek and Latin. This is not enough. Reading classical uh, books should uh, result in a moral and intellectual development of the reader. We need to also add that classical education is not only to, uh, based on reading uh, great uh, historical philosophical works. It's also about reading those uh, works in a systematic aspect, not historical aspects. So in the aspect of the universal content, timeless content, which uh, shed light on our life, not on the life of Romans and Greeks, this is history, but those works contain information, a way of life that should help us better understand ourselves and lead, better lead our lives. Because the uh, content of those works are universal and timeless, uh, they shed light on our current human problems. Uh, 
they can be helpful for um, people at uh, any time because they address a human being as a human being in a human uh, within the human nature and this a human being will always have similar analogical problems therefore it's good to learn from the experience uh, that uh, was created over the years this is about a human being and the uh, purpose of life an educated person as we know is interested in the whole reality but uh, he chooses um, and focuses their attention on what is subjectively the most important and this is what they also need to learn not everything because we are not able to absorb all the information that students should uh, understand the surrounding world should uh, think independently should not be manipulated uh, should know how to behave and analyze what's going on around them and have uh, their own opinions and to uh, be able to um, discuss culturally in classical education um, we encourage students to um, independently look for the truth. So it's very important to shape uh, this attitude. Without it, uh, without this attitude, uh, everything will fall. So this deep understanding of the world is uh, very important, but we need philosophical knowledge for uh, this. The philosophy should be understood classically in terms of its wisdom and uh, exact scientists, uh, sciences uh, which dominate in education, they do not provide uh, general knowledge about the world, so they cannot be the basis of the world uh, view of a uh, human being. So the full philosophy should uh, be more present in general education because it's about the development, full development of a human being and educational and intellectual and moral development. So we need to educate the humans and help them to develop themselves properly. It's about forming all the areas in which uh, a human needs uh, uh, to uh, gain competences. So when it comes to thinking, but also behavior, we need to also shape uh, the awareness uh, of belonging to a certain uh, culture. Today, with this relativism of cultures, we need to show the greatness of the classical European uh, culture, which uh, is really exceptional, because uh, this is um, the environment of our lives. We need to stress the importance of uh, European culture as uh, a, a pattern, important during the pattern of life, so that young people understand the their world better so that they can uh, be more included into the social and religious life. It's re all related with education, upbringing, and the upbringing aspect should also uh, be important. Uh, so uh, human freedom uh, should be uh, nurtured for the good, for the benefit of all of us. Uh, the human being also needs uh, wisdom knowledge so that uh, they can follow this knowledge, try to gain this knowledge. So we need to work also on the will and uh, sensory um, elements based on the heritage of uh, previous generations. Uh, the four, a human being is subjected to the education and the emotional sphere should be uh, subordinated to the will, which is directed by the mind. So the human being should uh, try to, should be able to find the truth. And that's why uh, we need to create the virtues, uh, intellectual and moral c uh, capacities. Uh, when it comes to education, we need a certain pattern of uh, being a fully developed uh, human. And then we choose methods. Uh, according to classical education, this pattern might be human nature and its uh, appropriate recognition. So who, uh, who a human person should objectively become? A human being has a nature. And therefore, human beings fulfill themselves. And uh, current education is preparing uh, students for professional life, preparing them to create uh, uh, tools and making a student uh, rather uh, an object 
A human being is a subject of uh, education. Education is a long-term process. The types of education can be a various. Uh, education has been forming generations for years in terms of knowledge and uh, skills, but also sensitivity, uh, moral and aesthetic. So we need to promote this uh, education uh, whose goal is the development of a human being so that uh, they become more of a human. Therefore, uh, the main uh, subject in Polish school is the Polish language, not uh, physics or mathematics. Uh, because the content of uh, those lessons uh, uh, so important to the humanity. I said something obvious, so I'm uh, uh, surprised by the applause. Because the content uh, contributes most to the humanization of uh, the human being, so to the development of a human being as a person. Uh, uh, I think I'll not be able to say everything, but let me just uh, finish uh, this uh, passage. Education has a lot of functions, but it's uh, limited to gaining professional skills. It's like a, a goods uh, which are put on sale. That's how the uh, parents uh, choose the schools for the children and pay a lot of money for those schools. Full education is not only professional education, but also upbringing, educating a human helping a human to uh, find a purpose uh, and a sense of their lives, because here is where we get lost. Uh, so a person needs to get skills to live a decent life. It should be the light um, on the path uh, of uh, our life. It's the human being who will be choosing, but they need to see it first. Uh, so education is a form of uh, presenting knowledge and skills. The education is a carrier of a human life. And uh, we call this life culture. We call it culture. So culture and civilization are distinguish uh, human education, which is leading a human being to the for humanity, and it's the school uh, where this knowledge should be presented. The school should provide what is the most precious, most important in the heritage of our culture. If it's important in culture, then it should be also important in schools, and it should not be marginalized. So here is where we decide what is the most important in our heritage, the school in the Greek or Roman education as was uh, the basis they discovered that a human being needed education and upbringing which enabled them for optimal development of their humanity. School understood this way was a priceless deposit of European culture for many years. The Greek school, which was the start of it, the beginning of it, uh, was aiming at creating a, a free a human. In the classical culture, freedom is understood positively. Um, and uh, if I am to choose, then I should be able to choose what, uh, what is important, the freedom to what. Uh. So the educational problem is about gaining wisdom and uh, uh, certain you know, skills to understand freedom in a positive way. And for this, we need classical education. I uh, cannot uh, fully uh, finish my speech because my time is up. Uh, I'm very sorry I thought I could speak longer because I was the first, but unfortunately not. But thank you very much uh, for your attention. Professor, thank you very much. We feel uh, there was more to be said, and uh, mm, uh, the fact is we need to uh, have take a coffee break at 12.30, and we, will, uh, we can all uh, use a cup of coffee, but uh, uh, before us, Professor Mikołaj Krasnodemski, a philosopher, his interests, scientific research interests are broad, particularly history of philosophy and uh, uh, philosophical anthropology, uh, and philosophical therapy, author of uh, close to 180 publications, uh, representative of many, uh, a member of many scientific 
and research institutions in philosophy and teaching. And his uh, 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 keynote is today is the classical Paideia's integrated cultivation of man. Everything is correct. I just wish to wish, uh, welcome Director General of the Ministry of uh, General. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to organizers for the invitation. I uh, almost got lost as I listened to uh, Professor Wubach's presentation. Uh, erudite speaker. He is the um, uh, author of a book about the absolute in Aristotle. So those of us who uh, encounter discussions and doubts of uh, secondary st school students about the absolutes and its importance, I would refer to that specific book of professors, and I recommend it uh, uh, highly. Uh, I take the opportunity, uh, as I am to speak about Paideia, it so happens that right up front we have the uh, 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 Professor Skrzydlewski and Nowakowski and Professor Ptaszek, uh, the periodicals uh, 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 review, uh, reviewers, so let me uh, do a uh, sort of crypto uh, advertisement of Paideia, uh, an annual publication. So this is a regular publication that's devoted to classical education. So I would uh, uh, recommend that over 200 texts, uh, altogether to date, 3,000 pages. Mm. Dear ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, uh, this was my way of introduction. I'd like to also explain myself as to why I wish to speak about classical paideia uh, and ask the question whether non-classical paideia can exist if we mean by it integral system of a bringing education. Then some modern educational mm, models uh, do not fulfill it even though they correspond uh, uh, with it. Uh, they are based on, on reductionisms and, and uh, anthropological errors and gradually move away from our ethology. I can say that pedagogical theories without truth about um, uh, man are dominant. And uh, as I look at the nature of uh, Paideia, I'd like to point it to its connection with classical philosophy, which, according to Świerzewski, is philosophy of substance, substance rather than uh, relevance uh, as uh, contemporary uh, philosophy would have it. I deliberately omit discussion on the term classical means, which is not a clear-cut definition. Mr. Zemietz has noted that right at the beginning. Um, hence, we this is being used quite arbitrarily in humanities. Classical philosophy encompasses the antiquity and Middle Ages as it continues through Neo-Thomism uh, of Etienne Gilson, Mieczysław A. Krompiec, and uh, recently past Mieczys Professor Mieczysław Gogacz. My purpose is to discuss Paideia in light of classical philosophy, pointing to effects of upbringing and education, uh, leading to perfection and even sanctity. I will therefore point to various constituents of Paideia. Well, what is it? Mm, Paideia from the Greek uh, Pais, the child, uh, is formation of a man from early age through education and upbringing, the universal basis of education, or the ideal developed by ancient Greeks, recognized as universal. And this is co connected, related to arete, 
which was shaped at different levels of human existence, as chivalric valor in Homer, ethos of working the land and shepherding and sense of justice, as Hesiod would have it, and democratic virtue available for those who want to develop it in Solon, and kalakokagatia, the idea of beauty and goodness in Plato, and magnanimity in Aristotle. The goal of Paideia is to perfect man and to ensure that it develops with integrity in line with the rational nature. A reason for the Greeks is the basis of understanding reality, its logicality and order, which translates into human conduct, morality, politics, economics, education. Uh, reason governs actions of nature because it's the most important, uh, one of the most important phallic, uh, faculty to intellect which is superior to senses and effects and to biological and reproductive processes, which is faculty, motor faculty, vegetative faculty. Intellect is responsible for knowing reality, which is most important goal of man, according to Aristotle. And even something divine, as Plato would have it. We uh, uh, arrive at truth and goodness. Philosophy, thus, is not possession of wisdom, but rather research, search for it and discovery of it. Man, a human being, arrives at, at it by cultivating their intellect, developing faculties, excellence, arete, uh, that shape his, their character and distance, distances them from desires and drives that violate nature and intellect. Paideia, uh, ancient Greeks conceived two terms, uh, paideia and pedagogia, uh, and pedagogike. It is without uh, intellectual recognition, if we uh, are driven by our emotions, we will uh, take those paths uh, without checking whether they are positive for us. So the Greeks have coined two terms referring to paideia. First one is pedagogia, and the second is pedagogike, both derived from pedagogos, the one who leads a boy being the slave leading boys uh, uh, of free citizens to Palestra, uh, the place where they practiced gymnastics. They wrestled uh, not because on, only for health and bodily aesthetics, but uh, for religious reasons. They hence uh, worshipped the Olympian deities. Uh, physical education and thus the military training contributed to emergence of profession of the pedagogue. The Greek world did not only care about young person's physical development, but also according uh, uh, to his spiritual development. According to Stefan Kunowski, education is the means used by human society to preserve and transmit physical and spiritual character. He adds that infinitely more important and richer possibilities are held within the human spirit, the prospects of human spiritual development. Hence, pedagogy is a skill of shaping, upbringing, and teaching, a set of educational activities and skills which become art of, of the arts as it works manifests itself in striving for independence. And parents notice this. A child wishes to be independent and undertakes various actions, even before they are fully prepared to make choices of truth and goodness. I lost myself. Pedagogy is a tech 
technique or a methodology of dealing with children and young people which can be passed on to others through training future teachers. Hence, in this sense, pedagogia is closer to paideia than pedagogica, although uh, these uh, uh, arts and techne were interwoven in, 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 among, for the ancients. Uh, such arts as painting, sculpture, dance, construction, carpentry, medicine, politics, rhetoric, grammar, and philosophy. In the Middle Ages, analogous uh, uh, or equivalent uh, understanding of the arts can be found in Richard of St. Victor, Peter Lombard, John of Salisbury, and many other medieval thinkers. And uh, Greek paideia is not merely limited to learning of a trade or a craft. It's about cultivation of the soul, of uh, kalogarthia, generosity. Paideia, therefore, uh, patches up the deficiencies of human nature. Man's upbringing must be uh, adapted to the nature of being, and it is accomplished through teaching, didaskalia, learning, mathesis, and exercise, askesis, whereby things uh, learned become uh, uh, a human second nature. As we say, habit is, the, is our second nature. Aretes, such as fitness, virtue, bravery, and uh, enduring disposition, can become such a habit through which a man chooses truth and goodness. Hence, in Arete, we have uh, this, the catalog includes principles of cognition, knowledge, wisdom, skills, prudence, justice, temperance, <coughs> fortitude. I would emphasize again that classical philosophy assumes that paideia encompasses the entire person and consists of cultivating their potential. Therefore, the substantial form and body, and this is uh, Professor Gorgoch's uh, definition, a real existing individual entity, spiritual and corporeal agent who enters relationships and is determined by the qualities he possesses on account of his exercise and his essence, existence and essence. Thus classical paideia encompasses existence of the person, soul and the body, personal relationships. In this way, paideia becomes education for the sake of love, freedom, truth, goodness, sovereignty, agency before the law and if a person wishes, also religious education. Consequently, the vision of a man also impacts moral philosophy, ethics, as well as economics and politics. What are the philosophical foundations of Paideia? As is well known, between the fourth and third century, Paideia ceased to be just a domain of poets and became the province of poet, uh, philosophers. Pedea and subsequently pedagogy shared the uneasy history of philosophy, ups and downs. And sophists brought Paideia into materialism and uh, uh, moral relativism, which Socrates and Plato warned against as they strove to redirect it toward idealism and Orphism. This, in turn, over, is overturned by Aristotle with his realistic metaphysics. By this, most important uh, philosophical starting points include the dispute between realism and idealism, second, dispute over what man is, and then dispute between nature and culture, and the dispute over arithology and protection of man. Uh, and the dispute over political theory and the philosophy of civilization. And I will only outline this uh, uh, in my statement. Uh, there are specialists such as Professor uh, uh, Skrzylewski who uh, deals with philosophy of civilization. So firstly, the triumph of realism, a rejection of uh, uh, and epistemological and uh, metaphysical so that mm, 
So that's the primary reality and uh, only secondarily um, uh, we are con conscious of it. So that sensory cognitive faculties are imprinted. Metaphysical realism, on the other hand, proclaims that existence is independent from thinking. It should be added that uh, at the level of classical paideia, we are moving to or based on a critical realism. So realism assumes that thinking is more important than external objective reality and that enables its subjectivization. The term realism, even in 19th century, was used to describe various idealistic philosophies in order to emphasize their internal opposition, for example, to the German idealism. But that did not make idealism uh, into realism. Professor Gogas would always cite the example. If you pour a glass of milk into a puddle, the, the, the puddle remains a puddle. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, we have hollowing and relativization of the term. Uh, so the attempts undertaken since Middle, ta uh, middle Ages of reconciling idealism and realism uh, were a fiasco. We had uh, attempts to do so through uh, Arioism, Suarez, uh, uh, Josef Schelling, uh, Bronisław Trentowski, and others. Also, Marxism as materialism, dialectic materialism, uh, supposed to be uh, a realistic philosophy while it remained only an ideology. Idealism, it, it seems that these neologisms, the first one, 1870, and the other one uh, 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 came up in 1796, somewhat earlier. Uh, is uh, mm, uh, I, this idealism has uh, several iterations materialism, spiritualism, Cartesian rationalism, and postmodernism. And, uh, and secondly, the exist, uh, existential view of man, uh, uh, definition of main. Uh, speaks about integral improvement. So man's potentialities uh, uh, are stand out uh, in metaphysical terms. Existence of, is, is already there, substantial form, whereas here it's not about the, just the existence but the ethical. So the ob ob objective here is the cultivation of the uh, perfection, intellectual and other improvement of intellect is formation, not deformation or defect. Uh, a man uh, has deficiencies in knowledge corrected by science, in action ethics and in production art, and in touch with transcendence uh, with personal God, this is religion. The most important activities uh, are are responsible for this process are intellect and human will. They, are, they become, can become tools for disintegration and deformation of a person. This brings us to the issue of anthropological era. This appeared in the teaching of John Paul II in the Centissimus Annus Encyclical of 1991. Uh, number 13. Some years later, uh, Andrzej Marynarczyk uh, 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 um, one of the, one of the uh, 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 metaphysical um, philosophers, uh, he uh, uh, ex expanded on this papical, uh, papal encyclical. Uh, on contemporary metaphysics. 
and he says that formation of false ideology, social political system, socialism, uh, and he proposes integral humanism, humanism that is not in the service of some ideology but truly reflects full image of human person. So we cannot allow for propagation of erroneous conceptions of man, which result in philosophical errors of reductionism. As his historian of philosophy, it seems to me there is no time or place to look at all of the concepts of a human person but we can uh, uh, collect them into five key ones. This includes materialist, second, spiritualist, which is Orphic, Platonic, third, Hillemorphic, Aristotelian, in other words, fourth, integral, Thomistic, and fifth, variabilistic, postmodern, the one that's linked with irrationalism, so popular today. The first assumes that a man is just matter, body, system of drives, aggregate of parts. It is a mechanical approach to man in which the uh, phenomenon of man's spiritual life cannot be fully explained. Additionally, this is characterized by instrumental, utilitarian approach to man, behaviorism. This error is uh, uh, to be overcome by the second concept, Orphic vision of man as a soul spiritualized, angelic being, which is confined to a body. Uh, consequently, it naively ignores the importance of what is corporeal in man, and uh, uh, relativism is being forced. The concept of inborn feelings. Uh, uh, finally, uh, Aristotelian anthropology, which breaks through the two limitations, and it assumes that man is unity of spiritual and corporeal. The most important power in man is his intellect, and hence man's actions should be permeated by reason. Uh, it is impossible to disagree with this. However, does the loss of or lack of reasonableness mean that we are no longer ma human, cease to be human? This problem uh, has not been fully worked out by Aristotle. But then the fourth integral concept of man, of Aquinas, uh, uh, seems to br overcome this problem. Uh, man is not just function or activity, because uh, human transcends cogitative and volitional acts. He is sovereign and can fully achieve their humanity by discovering and developing their nature uh, by establishing uh, personal relationships and uh, deciding. So here we have the uh, a revolution in metaphysics, but also uh, paideia and ethics. If uh, history of philosophy textbooks, we read that Kant introduces a revolution this is a great uh, simplification because it is Thomas Aquinas that introduces that revolution initially. So human being in this concept, the final concept, postmodernist, uh, introduced that human being is an irrational, um, lax uh, identity. It is uh, quite popular recently, but doesn't answer the question of who man is. Its corollary is relativism, acceptance of lack of principles, and voluntarism. Uh, denies rationality of man and his cognition. Man in this concept can be freely, subjectively shaped, fashioned in any way. There is a danger of abuse of man because this alludes to ideology and utopia. Fourth, third, the dispute at the level of understanding of nature and culture, we have uh, three various uh, concepts. Nature, which is not completely corrupt and evil, Thomas Aquinas. 
opposition to Martin Luther, who says nature is completely corrupt and evil, and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, and liberalism. Nature is good, while the source of evil is culture. And realism view culture is supposed to make up for nature's deficiencies. And uh, hence, uh, man is perfect, should not require education. So self, uh, uh, so usefulness instead of truth, uh, lack of constraints, use instead of love. Professor Gogac wrote about it, as well as Jean-Paul II. In realistic approach, culture is to fulfill the need, the lacks of nature. So it's a it's a tool that can be good uh, or used ill used. A human being is not perfect, so they should tend to tend to beauty, truth, uh, and goodness. Aquinas writes about four wounds of human nature. He, of after original sin, weakness, ignorance, malice, and covetousness. He adds uh, about loss of moderation, beauty, and order as a result of sin. And then uh, bringing back this harmony is the task of classical paideia. Fourth, paideia, there is this uh, dispute about arithology and protection of persons on the grounds of ethics, thus distancing itself from modern axiologies, which do not always promote patterns according to rational nature of man, ultimately impossible to achieve or devoid of goodness. Uh, goodness, uh, into putting it into hierarchy of decent, uh, useful, or pleasurable good. And this uh, uh, fifth, there is the uh, uh, discussion about the uh, community. Paideia requires a proper personalistic environment of communities and let Latin civilization, which protects a man from socialism, communism, Nazism, fascism, anarchy, liberation non-personalistic and not not protective of a human being. Tele teleology of Paideia. Every action, according to Aristotle, points to something. For example, a lazy man in a poem of Drechfa wants to kill his time. The man's goal is to achieve perfection, which is natural and written into the uh, 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 wise uh, uh, existence. The, the, the art of upbringing is to form, uh, as Arkadiu Frobaczewski writes, uh, it is ability to direct one's own life, ability to control variety of circumstances, and the preservation of sustained pursuit of goodness culminating in attainment of fullness of the good, God. And this is also uh, uh, at, at social level, this expresses itself in human personal connections, decisions, culture, and civilization. Uh, mm. The basic direction of education is truth and reality. Today, young people have a problem of being unclosed in virtual world. We therefore need to distinguish between the means leading to an end from the end itself. This is not so obvious in today's postmodern culture. According to Jacek Woroniecki, uh, probably under the influence of Latin perficere, perfectio, we form the word perfection, which means state of accomplishment. 
of bringing some activity to its proper end and goal. Perfect is what has been accomplished and accomplished in such a way that it can efficiently serve the purpose for which it was intended. Any work, then, is considered accomplished when it has been fulfilled not in an inferior manner, but as it should be, as demanded by the purpose it is intended to serve. This is why we only then can we say uh, this is done perfectly. Uh, it is no different with human life. In order to be brought to completion as it should be perfectly, it should reach the goal for which it would be it was intended. Only then can it be called perfect. That's a quotation from Jacek Woronicki. Uh, Friar Woronicki follows Aquinas, uh, adds that perfection is not only connected with attainment of happiness, but it is obligation of the human soul vis-a-vis uh, -vis the creator who has called it into existence. Uh, hence, we cannot uh, stop at nature and our ontology, but also uh, points to grace and spiritual life, ascetics, mysticism, uh, mysticism study, pointing the path of purification, enlightenment, and union. In the fifth volume of uh, uh, Paideia, we will have published uh, a manuscript, unpublished manuscript, previously unpublished manuscript of Woroniecki, which is a commentary on the on Thomas Aquinas's Summa. Paideia as education it is not uh, sufficient to just uh, educate, but also to upper bring. Otherwise, we will have a uh, wild, uh, wild link. This process of separation of the two has under uh, has been done in uh, uh, since the Enlightenment, uh, uh, since after Schopenhauer, human life. Uh, is um, human life is uh, uh, driven by blind uh, uh, desires. Pestolozzi, Frobel, Max Stirner, John Dewey, Paul uh, John Paul Sartre have in, uh, analogous views. But Narski divides modern pedagogy into uh, number, the pediocentrism liberal pedagogy, which consists of hedonism, Cartesian rationalism. This is different from Thomistic uh, intellectualism and vitalism and naturalism, Hobbes. Uh, then secondly, heterocentrism, which is totalitarianism, uh, uh, Hegel, Fichte, um, Marx. Alternative here is the Christian, third one, Christian pedagogy, uh, which is uh, opposed in contrast to uh, the earlier two. Classical idea is not a naive, overly pessimistic or optimistic proposal. It is realistic, uh, taking into account human nature. Uh, achievement of perfection is difficult, but possible difficulties arising from the very nature of man and the modern culture, which is not conducive to contemplation and wisdom, this needs to be, these difficulties need to be overtaken. I have one more minute to touch on my final conclusions. Paideia is therefore necessary. It introduces man uh, into the world of culture and allows them to creatively develop their essence, establish personal relationships with others. Let us not succumb to the myth of man, that man is perfect, he doesn't need education, and can always improve and learn something good. 
let me summarize quickly and say that the masters of the Middle Asians, such as um, Buddha says, if we stand on the uh, on the shoulders of uh, uh, giants, we can see much more than they themselves saw. And there are these giants that we can uh, get. The Jacek Woroniecki, Karol Wojtyla, uh, John Paul II, uh, Krompiec, Gogacz, Kieresz, uh, Barbara and Henry. As a consequence, we need to measure up to this at the at education against uh, negation of the truth, beauty, and good normal ethically without realism with uh, practicism loss of uh, uh, um, reductionism uh, which leads to reductionism education with the phenomenon of subjectism irrationalism in other words the negation of logos with consumerism with reductionistic understanding of freedom as self-will and destruction of actual authorities, with, with cultural Marxism, deconstruction, and uh, destruction of uh, traditional communities, family, school, and church. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you to Professor Krasnodemski from the um, Higher Vocational School in Głogów. Ladies and gentlemen, the next lecture will be in English. There are persons who are ready to I'll provide you with uh, headsets. So if you need a headset, uh, you will receive it. So, if you could please stay in your seats. I think that the lecture that we are about to listen to will be really fascinating because we have Professor David Lutz, uh, a professor of philosophy from Holy Cross College in the USA. But that's not all because um, a professor also uh, got a license at the famous West Point, so we can say that he's not only a specialist in philosophy, he's also an expert in a military area and special uh, security services. He has served as an officer of American Army in Germany for five years, so he's also a practitioner. But that's still not all. He uh, also has a title uh, uh, in management and business, so it's a, a very multi-instrumental person. Our guests from the United States, so let's give a round of applause. Professor David Lutz will make a speech about classical education and progressive uh, education. Jane Dobry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that I do not speak your beautiful language. I'm grateful to the organizers of this conference, especially Professor Novakovsky, for inviting me to talk with you today about this very important topic of classical education in this beautiful building. Poland is leading the world in preserving classical culture at a time when most countries have rejected it. So I and other Americans have much to learn from you about classical culture and classical education. My paper is entitled On Classical and Progressive Education. The cultural transformations 
that took place in the United States in the 20th century included a debate between defenders of classical education and proponents of progressive education. The purpose of classical education is not to prepare students to enter particular professions or embark on particular careers, but to equip them to begin the lifelong process of attaining human excellence, both intellectual and moral. The tradition of classical education is rooted in the conviction that great minds of the past have discovered important truths about the universe and humanity's role within it that remain true today. Classical education helps students actualize their potential by learning and putting into practice the wisdom of the ages that has stood the test of time. As a living tradition, Classical education is not static, but is constantly expanding our knowledge by applying immutable truths to new problems. Progressive education arose during the 1890s as a many-sided protest against pedagogical narrowness and inequity. The leading intellectual of the progressive education movement was John Dewey, 1859 to 1952, a member of the American philosophical school known as pragmatism, which claims that an ideology or proposition is true if it works satisfactorily, that the meaning of a proposition is to be found in the practical consequences of accepting it, and that unpractical ideas are to be rejected. In line with his philosophical pragmatism, Dewey believed there was an urgent need of a philosophy of education based upon a philosophy of experience. Dewey understood that the primary alternative to his progressive education was the tradition of ancient and medieval Europe. Quote, every moment, movement in the direction of a new order of ideas and of activities directed by them calls for, sooner or later, a return to what appear to be simpler and more fundamental ideas and practices of the past, as is exemplified at present in education in the attempt to revive the principles of ancient Greece and of the Middle Ages." End of quote. Dewey lamented that our present education is dominated almost entirely by the medieval conception of learning and understood the debate between classical and progressive education as a contest between belief in immutable truth and trust in the scientific method. Quote, it is argued by the critics of progressive education that science and its method must be subordinated, that we must return to the logic of ultimate first principles expressed in the logic of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas." End of quote. Dewey could see, quote, only two alternatives between which education must choose if it is not to drift aimlessly. One of them is expressed by the attempt to induce educators to return to the intellectual methods and ideals that arose centuries before scientific method was developed. The other alternative is systematic utilization 
of scientific method as the pattern and ideal of intelligent exploration and exploitation of the potentialities inherent in experience." End of quote. Although empirical research methods have certainly been quite successful in the natural sciences, it is not unreasonable to ask whether the hypothetical deductive method alone is the most appropriate research tool for increasing our understanding of how human persons with immaterial souls and free will gain knowledge. Nevertheless, Dewey maintained that scientific method is the only authentic means at our command for getting at the significance of our everyday experiences of the world in which we live. Dewey was a democratic socialist. His philosophy, philosophy of education was influential not only in the United States, but also in Russia and the Soviet Union. In pre-revolutionary Russia, Dewey's ideas were adopted as part of an educational reform movement that only after the revolution became officially promoted by the Bolshevist government. Do Dewey visited Moscow and Leningrad in 1928 at the invitation of the Soviet Commissar for Education and met Nadezhda Krupskaya, widow of Vladimir Lenin, who had read and written about Dewey's work and who became Deputy Commissar for Education in 1929. Dewey praised, quote, the marvelous development of progressive educational ideas and practice under the fostering care of the Bolshevist government." End of quote. There are significant points of agreement between Dewey's philosophy of education and that of Anton Makarenko, who is sometimes called the John Dewey of the Soviet Union. In 1937, Dewey became chairman of the Commission of Inquiry into the charges made against Leon Trotsky in the Moscow trials, which concluded that Trotsky was not guilty. The strongest critique of progressivism and defense of classical education was led by Robert Maynard Hutchins, 1899 to 1977, and one of Dewey's former students, Mortimer Adler, 1902 to 2001. Hutchins wrote in 1936, quote, the most striking fact about the higher learning in America is the confusion that besets it. Our confusion is so great that we cannot make clear even to our own students what we are trying to do." End of quote. Hutchins identified the roots of an incorrect understanding of progress in the philosophies of Rene Descartes, David Hume, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who began to think as though nobody had ever thought before. Progress came to be understood as increase of information acquired by empirical research methods. As a consequence, the sciences one by one broke off from philosophy and then from one another. Finally, according to Hutchins, the whole structure of the university collapsed, and the final victory of empiricism was won when the social sciences, law, 
and even philosophy and theology became themselves empirical and experimental and progressive. In 1942, Hutchins criticized an understanding of progress that is uninterested in intellectual debates of previous centuries. Quote, we attack old problems not knowing they are old and make the same mistakes because we do not know they were made. Dewey responded to Hutchins, criticizing his belief in perennial wisdom as inconsistent with scientific progress. Quote, the reactionary movement is dangerous, or would be if it made serious headway, because it ignores and in effect denies the principle of experimental inquiry and first-hand observation that is the lifeblood of the entire advance made in the sciences, an advance so marvelous that the progress in knowledge made in uncounted previous millennia is almost nothing in comparison." End of quote. Hutchins believed in the existence of a natural moral law that should guide all persons, because all persons of the human race share a common human nature. Dewey rejected this belief as the expression of a provincial and conventional point of view, of a culture that is pre-scientific in the sense that science bears today. Adler acknowledged that classical education in the United States had deteriorated in the late 19th century, but argued that progressivism was an overreaction. Quote, progressive education in all its forms was a sound and genuine reaction against the extreme aridity and empty formalism of classical education, which had reached the limits of its own degradation at the end of the last century. Unhappily, as always, the reaction went too far." End of quote. In an article on teaching the English language, Adler criticized, quote, the situation in our progressive schools where writing and reading are done in complete isolation from any acquaintanceship with the rules of grammar and logic, end of quote. And in an article comparing and contrasting the education of children and adults, Adler wrote, quote, except for those progressive schools where teachers mistakenly try to become equal with their pupils by getting on the floor with them and by asking their opinions about everything, the classroom situation is one in which the teacher is superior, end of quote. In 1946, Adler and Hutchins created the Great Books of the Western World program at the University of Chicago. They wrote, quote, the best way to a liberal education in the West is through the greatest works the West has produced, end of quote. They stated explicitly that they offered this set of 54 volumes, ranging from Homer to the 20th century, in opposition to progressive education. Quote, we believe that in the passage of time, the neglect of these books in the 20th century will be regarded as an aberration and not, as it is sometimes called today, a sign of progress. We think that progress, and progress in education in particular, depends on the incorporation of the ideas and images 
included in this set in the daily lives of all of us, from childhood through old age, end of quote. Despite the arguments of Hutchins and Adler, progressive education gained the victory over classical education in the United States. Dewey's works are now mandatory reading for anyone seeking an academic degree in education. The tradition of natural law, moral virtues, and the common good is of merely historical interest, if of any interest at all. Pragmatism and positivism are dominant. Education is understood as learning facts that can be proven mathematically or empirically. Metaphysics, ethics, and religion are in the domain of values or opinions, which are not about what we think or know, but about how we feel. There is a shift in emphasis from learning to read and write well to learning how to achieve high scores on standardized tests, which yield mathematically precise data that can be analyzed by the techniques of statistics. When students do write, their work is to be graded by means of assessment rubrics, not prudential judgment, so that the data is free of bias. Alan Bloom of the University of Chicago's Great Books Tradition wrote near the end of the 20th century, quote, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative." End of quote. Today, we have moved beyond the relativism of truth and live in a post-truth world. To attribute all that is wrong in education today to Dewey and his disciples would be an unjust oversimplification. Nevertheless, Dewey's influence is a significant contributor. One reason progressive education has been successful in supplanting classical education is that it appears to be more appropriate for a democratic society. Dewey wrote, quote, one thing which has recommended the progressive movement is that it seems more in accord with the democratic ideal to which our people is committed than do the procedures of the, of the traditional school, end of quote. Classical education began in antiquity within aristocratic societies. Until relatively recently in Western history, formal education was for a privileged few, not the general population. Plato's and Aristotle's arguments that democracy is worse than aristocracy are still relevant today. Thomas Aquinas believed that the best form of government is a mixed regime with elements of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Contemporary scholars such as Richard Legutko of Poland and Patrick Deneen of the United States have called our attention to the vices of liberal democracy. Nevertheless, American society today is predominantly democratic, with elements of oligarchy and plutocracy. And Dewey's progressivism is education for a democratic society. Dewey wrote, quote, a society 
to which stratification into separate classes would be fatal, must see it that intellectual opportunities are accessible to all on equable and easy terms." End of quote. Despite their many agreement, disagreements, Adler agreed with Dewey that in a democracy, formal education should be open to everyone. Quote, we are politically a classless society. Our citizenry as a whole is our ruling class. We should, therefore, be an educationally classless society." End of quote. One consequence of making university education possible for many more people is a divide within universities between liberal and professional education, especially business education. As Dewey makes the point, quote, Probably the most deep-seated antithesis which has shown itself in educational history is that between education in preparation for useful labor and education for a life of leisure." End of quote. While some university students are interested in knowledge for its own sake or knowledge for the sake of living a more excellent life, Many, perhaps the majority, understand university education as an investment of time and money for the purpose of pursuing a more lucrative career. How can classical education exist in a collegial relationship with business education, especially if it is assumed as axiomatic that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. Dewey understood that this dichotomy between the liberal arts and the servile or practical arts has existed since the classical era. Quote, the separation of liberal education from professional and industrial education goes back to the time of the Greeks and was formulated expressly on the basis of a division of classes into those who had to labor for a living and those who were relieved from this necessity." End of quote. At this point in history, one that is quite different socially and economically from the centuries in which classical education took root, we need to integrate the liberal, uh, we need to integrate liberal and professional education and open classical education to all, including students of business administration. In thinking about how to provide classical education to all students, including those who are preparing for a career in commerce, we can learn from the works of French neo-Thomist philosopher Jacques Maritain, 1882 to 1973. Although their ideas on education tend to represent polar opposites, Dewey and Maritain were in agreement that we should eliminate the segregation of liberal and practical education. Maritain thought that the democratic way of life demands primarily liberal education for all. And he asked, quote, how is it possible to extend liberal education and training in the humanities not to a few more or less destined to a life of leisure, but to all, destined as they are to be involved in the toils and anxieties of daily labor, in the hard necessity of making a living, and who need for this vocational and technical training." 
end of quote. Mari Tam believed that the answer was to achieve an integral education for an integral humanism. He understood that if people are to avoid living divided lives, their education must be unified. Quote, the whole work of education and teaching must tend to unify, not to spread out. It must strive to foster internal unity in man. End of quote. Education today suffers from two vices. First, it is dominated by a positivist, pragmatic, progressive philosophy of education that considers classical education to be antiquated and irrelevant. Knowledge is understood primarily as knowledge of facts that can be verified empirically or mathematically. Second, the classical education that still survives is separated from preparation for the careers that most citizens of contemporary democracies will pursue upon graduation. Progressive education has a competitive advantage relative to classical education because it is education for a democratic society, not for an aristocratic society that no longer exists. In order to promote classical education today, we need to integrate the liberal and practical arts. St. John Paul II's discussion of the subjective dimension of work teaches us that human persons can become virtuous not only through contemplation, but also through work. Although the classical tradition makes a distinction between theoretical and practical wisdom, both are virtues. Teaching students what it means to live a good life and teaching them how to earn a living should be understood as a unity, not as a duality. Maritain envisioned a world of tomorrow where the dignity of work will probably be more clearly recognized and the social cleavage between homo faber and homo sapiens done away with. Classical education should be integrated with professional education, especially business education, so that students understand what it means to live a virtuous life in the world of work. Thank you very much.